Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to an introduction to two-column proofs. What's a two-column proof, you ask? Well, I give you some information, probably a picture. I ask you to go from this thing to that thing, and I write out a two-column proof where I write out statements and reasons showing why this is allowed to become that. Think of the statements as you're solving a two-step equation, right? And along the way, you show your work and you're just kind of whittling your way down, blah de blah de blah de blah de blah de blah Well, the statements on the left side are basically the work that you show. Now, what I would do is I would say, oh, subtraction property of inequality, division property of inequality, those are my reasons. So a two column proof, and I'm gonna quick clear this out. A two column proof has me list all of the work that I would show to get from my given to my prove, and my reasons would be all the theorems and the postulates and the blah de blah de blah de blahs that I know that have this make sense. Now, since this is an introduction to two column proofs, I'm giving you all the statements and it's my job to come up with the reasons. So whenever you have a two column proof, 99.9% .9 of the time, your first statement and reason is gonna be your given. Write that out. If this was completely blank, you would always start out with A C equals AB plus AB. And my reason is because that's the thing that you gave me, dummy. Step one, finished. Step two says AB plus BC equals AC. Now I have to look at this information and try to be like, okay, well, where did I get that? Did I get that from up here? No, I didn't. Uh, let's look at my picture, AB. Oh, there's AB. So that matches up with that. BC, there's BC. So that matches up with that. And Oh yeah, I guess it would make sense that if I added those together, I would get AC which is the whole thing. Now, whenever I take two or more segments and add them together to get a bigger segment, that's called the segment addition postulate. Let's write that out. Segment addition postulate. One more time, whenever you have to add segments, two or more, to get a larger segment, it's called the segment addition postulate. Similarly, when you do proofs, when you do the same thing with angles, it's called the angle addition postulate. So it's like angle one plus angle two equals angle blah, 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 angle addition postulate. That's step two, we're done. Now they went from AB plus BC equals AC, and they turned that into AB plus AB equals AB plus BC. What gives them the right to do that? Well, usually, not every time, but very often, a step or a statement comes from a combination of two previous statements. This is what I notice, that AC is AB plus AB. AC also happens to be AB plus BC. So if AC is this and AC is that, then this equals that. All I'm doing is I'm saying since AC equals AB plus AB, there you are. And if AC equals AB plus BC, there you are. Then AB plus AB equals AB plus BC. This is called the substitution property of equality. Now I'll just say substitution, substitution property. And leave it at that because space. Now, how did I do that? I replaced AC with AB plus BC. So technically, or I could just write it out. I mean, either way, I wrote it out. You could also use the transitive property, uh, but I already said substitution. We're leaving it at that. Now I have AB, and let me clean this up so I can see it because I'm at my last step and I need to see how I can get from three to four. AB plus AB equals AB plus BC. All of a sudden, it's now AB equals BC. Well, how can I go from two things on the left and two things on the right to one thing on the left and one thing on the right? I would have to get rid of one from each side. <gasps> There's an AB on the left. There's an AB on the right. If I subtracted AB from both sides, 
that would cross out and give me A, B equals B, C, which is that guy right there. So what did I do to both sides? I subtracted. So what is this? The subtraction property of equality. Mm, I can squeeze it in. It depends on what kind of teacher you have. They might be okay with you saying subtraction property. Uh, I like to write out as much as I can because it sounds a whole lot better. But this is an introduction to a two column proof. And with two column proofs, again, you're given information, you're told to prove something, and you have to go from step A to step whatever and explain what you did. And oftentimes with segments, we're going to have to do segment addition postulate, oftentimes substitutions involved. And in this case, we had subtraction too. So lots of lots of lots of fun. I enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. More to come. All right, kids, what do we have here? We have a two column proof and a whole lot of blanks to fill in a whole lot of them. In a previous video, I gave you all the statements and I had to give you all the reasons. Well, now we're everywhere. And what I have here is a bunch of angles glued together. I have a straight line here. I got what looks like it could be a right angle, but I don't know. I got these angles are next to each other. Anything could happen. But what it's telling me to write off the bat is angle AEB, which is one, two, three, is complementary to angle BEC. So angle AEB is complementary to BEC. Let's get started. Uh, oh, and what I have to show is I have to show that the measure of angle AED, which is U, is 90 degrees. So got a lot of work to do. Step number one is always your given. So there you have it. Step number one, AEB is a complement of BEC. That was my given. My reason is given 90% of the time, 99% of the time, your first step in a two column proof is going to be your given. So let's not burn too much brain energy on that. Step two, statement two is, I don't know, but it says the reason is definition of complementary angles. What does complementary angles mean? Two angles that add up together. Oh, so what they might want us to say is by definition of complementary angles, the measure of angle AEB plus the measure of angle BEC is going to be 90 degrees. All right, I can handle that. Uh, measure of angle AEC is equal to the measure of angle AEB plus measure of angle BEC. Okay, well, what's AEC? All right, this whole thing right there. And that's the measure of angle AEB plus the measure of angle BEC. Oh, I see. They want me to show that this whole thing is that guy plus that guy. Well, whenever we add two angles together, the reason why we're allowed to add those angles together is because of the angle addition postulate. In a previous video, you saw me do segment addition postulate, and then I said, later, we're going to do angle addition postulate. Well, here we are later. I hope you're watching all the videos. Otherwise, none of this made sense. But angle addition postulate is a rule that says, hey, uh, you're allowed to say that one whole angle is equal to two angles added together. The measure of angle AEC is 90 degrees. Now, that's because... The measure of angle AEC is 90 degrees. Now, usually when we get to a part where we look up here and we don't see a whole lot, we're trying to piece two previous pieces of information together. I see a 90 degrees up here. I don't see any 90 degrees in my given. I don't see any 90 degrees on my picture. And you're not allowed to go from your proof. So I have to look at previous information. And I see that 90 degrees lives up here in step two. Let me give you a circle. Also, the measure of angle AEC is right here. Oh. AEB, BEC, AEB, BEC. I know the measure of angle AEB plus the measure of angle BEC is 90 degrees because if I were to say 
that guy equals 90 and that guy also equals AEC, then AEC equals 90. This is the substitution property. And if you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. What just happened? Let me explain it again. Let me explain it again. If I gave you a problem that was like A equals B and B equals C, I'm allowed to say A equals C. Because if A is B and B is C, well then B, these guys are the same thing too. So 90 equals A, B, B, C. A, E, C equals A, B, B, E, C. So since A, E, C equals 90, that's because we just replaced that guy and that guy with each other. Okay, substitution property. Now we're down to the measure of angle AED plus the measure of angle AEC equals 180 degrees by the definition of supplementary angles. So even though I don't say supplementary up here, I see that all of this gives me a perfectly straight line. So they're saying, well, let's just add AED, which is U, and AEC, which is U, and make it 180. My next step is to do the substitution property of equality. So what they want me to do is they want me to replace something up here so that I can go from five to seven. Now, if I just said something about AEC equaling 90 degrees and I see AEC appear and I kind of don't want it to be there anymore because it's now gone in seven, why don't I just replace AEC with 90? the measure of angle AED plus 90 equals 180 degrees. Now that is substitution because I substituted 90 for AEC. My last step is to go from AED plus 90 equals 180 to just get rid of that 90 and make it 90 over here. How do I do that? Well, if I subtract 90 from both sides, then AED equals 90 if I just subtract 90 from both sides. So what am I gonna do? The subtraction property of equality. Subtraction, ugh, looks terrible. Property of equality. And so there's my proof. Okay, this is still like an introduction to two column proof. So again, you're going to see me filling a whole lot of blanks, but this used a lot of angles and a lot of reasons, but a lot of angle addition problems and a lot of se uh, segment addition proofs are going to involve you like adding stuff, substituting information, and probably doing some kind of solving an equation type thing, which is exactly what we did here. It's just this one was a lot more involved than my previous video if you watch that. But we're on our way, not easy stuff. That's why this is called gross geometry because it's not that much fun, unless you're sick, in which case gross geometry should be right up your alley. Given the measure of angle one equals the measure of angle three, I need to prove that EBA, which is this chunk right here, is equal to the measure of angle CBD, uh -oh. that chunk right there. All right. I got myself a two column proof. All of my reasons are given. Some of my statements are given. I need to go from one to six. Well, if you are watching my videos in order, if you're watching my gross geometry videos in order, which if you're not, shame on you. The two previous examples looked very similar to this, where my first statement was always a given. It even tells me it's a given, so why would that change? 95, 91, 90, 10, 90 billion percent of the time, your first statement's going to be your given for a two column proof. So that's done. Now what? They are going to tell me that the measure of angle EBA, which is EBA, which is this whole thing right here, EBA is two plus three angle addition postulate, makes sense. We saw that in a previous video. The measure of angle EBA is also two plus one. How do I know that? Well, three is one because we said that up here. So if three is one, then my reason from turning three into one is because three is one. That's the substitution property of equality. So we've seen that before. They could have made this problem a little bit more difficult and made me guess that, but I'm not gonna complain. 
So now it says the measure of angle EBA equals blank from the commutative property of addition. Now the commutative property of addition means that if you say something like three plus one, it's the same as one plus three. You're gonna look at this and say, this is extremely picky. I don't like it. And you're kind of right. But the difference between three and four is three says two plus one, four is gonna be one plus two. Pointless, yes, but many proofs are. Proofs are annoying, but commutative property, if it says, no, 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 you need to use the commutative property, just think of a commute to work. If you take root three uh, to work, or and then take root one, then on the way home, you're gonna take root one to root three. Makes sense, it should. So now the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two equals stuff from the angle addition postulate. So let's go back to our picture because the last time we used the angle addition postulate, we said that two plus three is EBA. Now I want one plus two and one plus two is CBD. So we are going to say that the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two is the measure of angle CBD due to the angle addition postulate. And so now I'm at the very end. And what always happens at the very end? What you're trying to prove. So we could say the measure of angle EBA is congruent to the, well, equal, equal, sorry, sorry, is equal to the measure of angle CBD by the transitive property of equality. The transitive property of equality is kind of like the law of syllogism. The law of syllogism says, hey, if A equals B and B is C, then just skip the B and go right from A to C, A to C. Transitive property is the same thing. So what are they doing here? Way up here, they say that EBA is one plus two. One plus two is CBD, so let's skip the middleman and say EBA is CBD. And that was supposed to be EBA, so let me erase that and make that look better. Otherwise, that would not be a good way to end this video to have a wrong statement up on the uh, picture. But despite that tiny little mistake, that's my guy. So that's my introduction to uh, two column proofs. Not a lot of fun unless you have a death wish. So there you go. Make a flow proof. What's a flow proof? Is it like a flow chart, you ask? Kind of. Flow chart is like, if I do this, then that happens. And if I do that, then this 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 happens. That's a flow chart. A flow proof is kind of like the same thing, but with statements and reasons instead. So I'm going to prove this by making a flow proof. What do I got? I am being told that segment AD is congruent to segment CE. So AD is U congruent to segment CE. That's U. Okay. And I need to prove that AC, which is U, is equal to DE, which is U. So segments, uh, segments that are made up of one or two more segments, probably we're going to deal with uh, segment addition, postulate, stuff like that. But I don't want to, you know, take away from the excitement of finding out what's going to happen. Let's just get started. Uh, segment AD is congruent to segment CE because that's the given. You always start out with the given. Now I'm gonna put the given in a box. It all depends on what your teacher or professor or whomever, the book that you're using, wants you to do as far as flow proof stuff. But I like to put my reasons in the box. What's in the box? The reasons, seven. Uh, also, Incubus, I think. No, Hoobastank is the reason they wrote that song. Very popular about 25 years ago when I was young. All right. It looks like to me that I'm starting out with segment congruent to a segment, distance equal to a distance. They probably want us to make things look like that. So what I'll do is I'll switch this up and make it AD is equal 
to CE and blame that on the definition of congruent. I said define. Oh, off to a banging start. Definition of congruent or congruence. But that's what I'm going to do. It's proper to do as many steps as you can, even if it looks sloppy. And in this, it might look a little on the sloppy side, but you know what? There's only like five of you guys watching this anyway. Uh, now what? Well, I need to go from A, D, and C, D to A, C, and D, E. So how can I do that? How can I turn these guys into these guys? Well, A, D includes A, C because A, D is A, C plus C, D. So let's say that. Let's say that A, D is equal to A, C plus C, D. Now, when you take two segments and add them to make one more segment, that's called the segment addition postulate. I have a feeling that's going to happen again almost immediately. Postulate. All right. Segment addition postulate. All right. So if I do that with AD, I mean, it makes sense that I should do the same thing with CE. So let's take this arrow, bring it up here. Look at me flowing. Uh, I'm going to say the same thing with CE, that CE is the same thing as CD plus DE. And that too is the segment addition postulate. The sap as people from Canada would say, because they like maple syrup. This is what I get for talking and punning at the same time, postulate. All right, no more, I'm done. done. I'm done entertaining until I get this complete. All right, so now that I said what CE is, and now that I said what AC is, I noticed that I have CD and I have AC, and I should be able to isolate them, right? My job is to get AC and DE all by itself. So why don't I get AC all by itself by subtracting CD? And why don't I get DE all by itself by subtracting CE? And I'll do that all in one big step. So what I will do is I will take this one, I will subtract CD from both sides to get AC all by itself. So AC, if I subtract CD, AC is going to equal AD minus CD. Similarly over here, if I get DE all by itself, it's because I subtract CD from both sides. So DE equals CE minus CD. All right. So now I have a, oh, and by the way, I did that because I subtracted stuff. So that is the subtraction property of equality. Subtraction property of equality. Let's put it in a box and draw an arrow up to here. Flowing once again like a rapper. Uh, all right. So I need to get AC equal to DE. AC is AD minus CD. AC is CE minus CD. Oh, that's a shame. If only these guys were the same, then I could say that these were the same. Oh, wait a minute. AD and CE are the same. So if I take one of these, if I take D, for example, and I replace CE with AD, I now have AD minus CD. And what I did is I rewrote DE equals and replaced CE with AD. So I use the substitution property. Running out of room, so I'll put prop. Okay. Now my last step. My last step 
is now that I know that DE is AD minus CE, CD, and AC is also AD minus CD, that means that AC and DE are the same. AC equals DE. And I could use the transitive property. I could use the substitution property. I haven't used the transitive property yet today. By the way, the transitive property says that if A equals B and C equals B, then A equals C. That's the transitive property. So that works here. Transitive property of equality. I am done my flow proof. So I'm going to be honest, flow proofs aren't used a whole lot in uh, geometry. They exist. They are done. You know, if you're taking a high school geometry course, you'll have a, a teacher do one, two, or three of them. Maybe have you do one, two, or three for homework. Maybe have you do one for a quiz, one for a test. But then they kind of disappear. Uh, if you're watching my videos one after another, you are usually going to run into two column proofs a whole lot more. But flow proofs are still out there. They still exist. And in a way, I did this the same exact way I would do a two column proof. These are my statements not in the box and my reasons are in the box. It's just a different way that it looks. And in my opinion, it's uglier. But I'm not here to judge beauty that's up to judges of beauty pageants. Like and subscribe. Make a paragraph proof. A paragraph proof is basically like a flow proof with more words, more sentences. If you remember from a previous video, those of you who watch all my videos in order, the flow proof looked like this, right? Where we said, this, the statement is blah, 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 and the reason is this, and the statement is blah, 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 and the reason is this. Well, now, instead of having a, a picture of a flow proof, it's going to be just in flat out sentences, and we're going to make it sound like, like a little essay. Okay. Uh, all right. So what do we have? We have given KMN. So KMN, KMN is 28 degrees. I can handle that. We're also given the fact that PTS, PTS is 118. I have to prove that JMK, JMK, the angle of this guy right here, is congruent to angle str, which is this angle right here. Okay, so I have to show that these guys are congruent by using numbers like 28 and 118. Uh, let's start out with the given like we always do. We are given, now keep in mind, little little warning, just because I write it out this way doesn't mean it's the only way of doing it. I am, those of you who watch my videos know that I stumble and fumble over my words all the time. I accidentally misspeak. Uh, I misspell words all the time. Don't be like, wow, that guy is the, the, the Lord of grammar. No, I trust me, no. Uh, it's just the way that I'm doing is a way that's correct, but certainly not the only way. So we are given that the measure of angle KMN is 28 degrees and uh, the measure of angle PTS is 118 degrees, period, end of sentence. All right, how can I start connecting these dots? Uh, I need to find a way to connect green with purple here. So why don't I find out what uh, green is, why don't I find out what purple is, and I'm sure at some point I will find out that they're the same. Now what I know is I see that right angle right there, okay? That right angle right there. So what I can say is that angle J, M, K, and 
angle KMN add up to 90 degrees by the definition of right. Now, let's not say right, let's say complementary angles because right angles implies one angle. So let's say by definition of complementary angles, complementary angles is just more proper. Complementary angles. So maybe what I should have said is that the measure of angle JMK plus the measure of angle KMN equals 90. Probably a, a better way to say it. Already my paragraph proof isn't falling apart. It's just much worse than it has to be. Uh, now, if that's the case, uh, what I can do is I can replace measure of KMN with 28. Using substitution, the measure of angle JMK plus 28 equals 90. Now I can solve for JMK by subtracting 28. So the measure of angle JMK equals, what is that, 62 using the substitution property. Nope, the subtraction property. Subtraction property. Cool, so what I have, I have that you are now 62. Now a lot of this, most of you kids watching this would be like, dummy. I know that I could just do 90 minus 28 and you wrote out like half a paragraph just to say that. Do we really have to do these for proofs? Yup. That's why this series is called gross geometry. It's not called easy happy time geometry. Easy happy time geometry is for you Khan Academy jerks. I apologize to the Khan Academy jerks. If they want to sponsor any of my videos, I'd be very happy. Now I found out what the measure of angle J and K is. Why don't I say that the measure of, now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to avoid writing so much here and just kind of jump right to that and say that the measure of angle STP, Stone Temple Pilots, plus the measure of angle PTS equals 180 by definition of supplementary angles. See, these guys add up to make 180. And I'm hoping by doing 180 minus 118, I get 62. And if I get 62, then I can show that these guys are the same. So what I can do now, since I can't ever make it that simple because proofs are a nightmare, what I can do now is I can go back up here and remember that PTS is 118. So the measure of angle, uh, was it supposed to be STP? ST, wait, that's an R? Oh my gosh. R. So that Stone Temple Pilots joke is dead. And that's still PTS. STR PTS. All right, I'm good. I just, you know, I don't have my glasses on, so I really can't see anyway. The measure of angle STR, okay, plus, let's change PTS, uh, is 118 equals 180 using substitution. If I subtract 118 from both sides, I get that the measure of angle STR 
equals 62 using the subtraction property of equality. Now that I know that the measure of angle STR is 62, and I found out up here that the measure of angle J and K is 62, I can now finally say that J and K is the same as STR. But first, <laughs> I have to say the measure of J and K is the same as the measure of angle STR using the transitive property. Transitive property says if A is C and B is C, then A is B. So that's what transitive property is. So using the transitive property, and now, if their measures are the same, we can finally end this thing and say angle J M K is congruent to angle S T R uh, by definition. Of congruence. I nailed the spacing, very proud of that, but this is a paragraph proof, okay? This is a paragraph proof. Normal people, including myself, whenever, before you start your proofs, what you really should do is you should be like, well, if my job is to prove that this guy is the same as this guy, I know that that's a right angle, so 90 minus 28 is 62, and this is 180 degrees, so 180 minus 118 is 62, so these are the same, and this is what you have to do to prove it. It's the proof that's a nightmare, and it is a nightmare. But the best thing about nightmares is eventually you wake up. I think that's in the Bible or if I just made it up, I don't know. Like and subscribe. Make a paragraph proof given B is the midpoint of AC, C is the midpoint of BD, prove that AB equals CD. All right, so what's a paragraph proof? It's a proof where, you know, you say given blah, 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 then blah, 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 because of this property, then blah, 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 because of that property, then blah, 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 because of that property, and therefore AB equals CD. So what do I have to do with this problem? Well, I have to state the given first, and the given is B is the midpoint of AC. So here's AC, B is the midpoint, which means that's going to happen, okay? What else do we know? We know that C is the midpoint of BD. So C is the midpoint of BD, which means that is going to happen because by definition of midpoint. And so by using this, I need to show that AB is congruent to CD. So probably a lot of segment addition postulate stuff probably a lot of this guy's congruent to that guy, this guy's congruent to that guy's stuff. Um, and we have to put it in a paragraph using sentences and stuff like that. So we are given your first statement, your first sentence, your first step is always the given. We are given B is the midpoint of a C and C is the midpoint of B, D, period. So I said this in a previous paragraph proof video, don't cling on to my wording structure because I'm terrible at writing sentences. I'm just doing it so that it's right. You know, I might have misspelled words. I might have to erase. I just know it's right. Now, what I also know what midpoint means. Midpoint means takes a line segment and cuts it in equal parts. So 
we could say by definition of midpoint, we could say that AB equals BC. And while we're at it, let's take care of this one too. And BC is congruent or equal rather to CD. Now you're going to love this because this problem or this uh, proof is done after this sentence. If AB is BC and BC is CD, then by the transitive property, AB is CD. So let's say that by the transitive property, AB is CD. And that's it. We're done. So I was expecting this problem to be a whole lot worse than it really was, and it really wasn't that bad at all. Sometimes paragraph proofs aren't that bad. In a previous video, it was bad. In this one, it was not. But uh, yeah, here's paragraph proofs for you. Tons of fun. Write an indirect proof to show that the square root of 18 is not 3 root 6. What the crap is an indirect proof, you ask? Well, let's first assume Let's assume the opposite of the conclusion here. Conclusion. I don't even know if that's spelled right. What's the conclusion? That's the conclusion. The second part of what you're trying to prove. Let's assume the opposite. In other words, to do this problem, we're going to assume that the square root of 18 is 3 root 6. Then what we do is we do some work, whatever work we have to do, and arrive at a contradiction. What's a contradiction, you ask? It's a lie. Basically, your girlfriend is all like, you talking to girls, you talking to girls, and you all like, no, I'm not. And then she like, uh, let me see your snap. And you're like, oh, all right. And then you hand over your phone and she like, I, I'm going to assume that you're telling the truth, but I'm going to check your phone anyway. And, and she look at your phone and she slides into your DMs and she sees that all these other girls are sliding into your DMs. So her assumption that you were telling the truth is wrong. Therefore, you are lying and therefore you are talking to girls and looks like you're finding yourself a new girlfriend. What we're doing is we're going to assume the opposite. Find out that the opposite is wrong and say, well, that's wrong. So therefore, the original statement that we are given was true. Okay? So one more time, we're going to assume the opposite of this. We're going to do some math and find out that that's not right, which means if it, the math doesn't work out, they can't be equal. Therefore, this can't equal that. So let's try it. Let's give it a shot. Let's give it a shot. Let's give it the old college try. Okay. Now, as with all of my proofs and paragraph proofs, just because it's the way I write it doesn't mean it's the only way. It's just a way that is correct. All right. So let's assume, let's assume that the square root of 18 is 3 times the square root of 6. Well, I know from a math teacher named Mick, Mick Parrish, you know, the math teacher go, that the square root of 18 can be broken down to the square root of 2 times 3 times 3. And you can rip out a group of 3s, and you are left with 3 times the square root of 2. 
Wait a minute. Root 18 is supposed to be 3 root 6. We just found out that root 18 is actually, and let me write it out so it looks a little bit better, root 18 is actually 3 root 2. Okay, so I'll say that. But we assumed this, but root 18 is actually 3 root 2. Therefore, therefore, root 18 can't be 3 root 6. So we'll say that root 18 cannot be equal to boop, 3 root 6. And we're done. That's our indirect proof. We assume that the opposite of that occurs. We find out that our assumption is wrong. Therefore, since our assumption is wrong, the original assumption must be right. Indirect proof. All about you cheating on your girlfriend. Or boyfriend. Make an indirect proof. If the measure of angle A, that guy, and the measure of angle, oh, is 64, and the measure of angle B, that guy, is 116, then A and B are supplementary. What's an indirect proof? I already made a video on indirect proof, so I'm not gonna break it down. But first things first, we are going to take the second part of what we're trying to prove and assume the opposite. We're going to assume that they're not supplementary. Then we do some math, find out that we're wrong, and therefore they must be supplementary. Okay, so that's indirect proofs in a nutshell. You assume the second part is a lie, do some math and find out, whoopsies, I was actually wrong by assuming that, therefore the original must be true. So let's assume that angle A and angle B are not supplementary. Supplementary means they add up to 180 degrees. Supplementary means they add up to 180 degrees. Uh, let's get a different color. Uh, the measure of angle A is, well, I'll say the measure of angle A plus the measure of angle B is the same thing as 64 plus 116, which is 118. So we're assuming that the measure of angle and B are not supplementary, but when I add angle and B, A and B, but the measure of angle A plus the measure of angle B add up to 180, which means they are supplementary. And I can end it right there. I mean, I'll need to make a, an extra sentence to make it sound prettier. I know in my previous indirect proof video, uh, I made it an extra sentence, but again, you know, clinging onto the way that I structure this is not necessary. All you have to do for an indirect proof is assume the opposite of the other part, the second part, find out that you're wrong, which means the original thought, the original statement is actually correct. And that's what we did here. Indirect proofs, tons of fun. All about lying. Given points A, two and three, and B, negative two, five, make an indirect proof to show that C, zero, three, is not the midpoint of A, B. All right, so with an indirect proof, what you have to do is assume the opposite of the second part that you're trying to prove. So it says, make an indirect proof to show that C03 is not the midpoint. Let's assume that C is the midpoint. of AB. So let's do that. Let's find out what the midpoint is. Let's break out the midpoint formula. M equals x sub 1 plus x sub 2 all over 2 comma 
y sub 1 plus y sub 2 all over 2 and point. If I call u x sub 1, y sub 1, call u x sub 2, y sub 2, then the midpoint is going to be 2 plus negative 2, x sub 1, x sub 2, all over 2, comma, 3 plus 5 all over 2. 2 plus negative 2 is 0, 0 over 2 is 0. Okay? 3 plus 5 is 8, 8 over 2 is 4. So we assumed that C, 0, 3 is the midpoint. We found out that the midpoint is actually, and I'll say that, the midpoint is actually 0, 4. So we can end up by saying, so C, which was 0, 3, is not the midpoint. All right, so I kind of like indirect proofs. This one was actually pretty fun, pretty easy. I enjoy this stuff, you know, the point of <laughs> the midpoint. <laughs> And I'm sure a lot of you Gen Zers are like, the point is mid because of slang. Anyway, the whole point of um, doing indirect proofs is I give you a statement. You assume the second part's wrong. You do some work and realize, oh, whoops, maybe it was right. And then state that it was right. So you admit defeat. So all about lying and, and, and having to fess up for your own mistakes. Indirect proofs just make me more depressed as time goes on. Reminds me of my marriage. <laughs> uh, like and subscribe.